here on a beautiful spring day. A very interesting guest I want to introduce you today. Ivory Johnson is the founder of Delancey Wealth Management. He's a member of the CNBC Financial Advisors Council. Ivory, thanks for joining us. We've been caught up in a lot of issues around the markets that I want to get to, but I want to just start with some of the issues that are on all of our mind. We've been talking about social justice and the relation to the relationship to economic justice in a way. Um, I were, was had a conversation with you the other day and you, you brought up something very interesting. You, you told me all of this starts with wealth and how it's created. W what does create wealth and how, how can we encourage people to get on the right path to do that? Well, you know, first you have to understand, you know, what precipitated the wealth gap. Um, and some of this is just institutional in nature. If you think about the basic tenets of capitalism, access to capital, uh, being paid according to what the free markets are willing to bear, fungible assets, your house is valued the same way my house is valued. You know, we didn't have access to some of those things, enforcement of contract. And so right now, we, we're starting from a different place. I mean, 80% of the rocket fuel is to get off the ground, 20% to stay in orbit. But the other problem is now we're not passing down information to the next generation. We're not having conversations about what do you do with your 401k when you start working. And when you vet that information, obviously that's going to lead to some wealth gaps, not just in the African-American community, we're seeing it across all demographics as well. Yeah. Uh, you, we, of course, there's other things out there. Tax policies favor the wealthy. Um, there's skilled versus unskilled workers. You had an interesting point that you you'd made in an early conversation I had with you about skilled versus unskilled and how to acquire them. Well, if you look at the job losses, more than half of them are unskilled laborers. Um, and so, and those jobs might not be coming back. So that's just going to accelerate the wealth gap. And as far as the taxes are concerned, you, you looked at, you know, listen, corporate tax rate, taxes paid as a percent of our GDP was the lowest it's been since World War II. And they still cut corporate taxes, right? So those tax benefits went to, you know, largely to the wealthy. We can have a conversation about whether that's fair or not, because, you know, wealthy people disproportionately pay a lot of money in taxes relative to what they make. Um, but it doesn't generate wealth for the, the overall economy and certainly helps hurt the people at the lower end of the echelon. Yeah. You once told me a great story about the one thing your dad told you to do in your life and one thing he told you not to do. I think it's a great little parable yeah. about uh, what to think about and what matters. Well, you know, when I came home from college, you know, I came home and I said, uh, I got a good job. And I said, Dad, I'm going to buy a car. And he says, well, you know, what kind of car? So I'm going to buy a Jeep. He goes, oh, what color? I said, red with a tan interior. He goes, you're going to put speakers inside. I said, I'm going to have the top of the line sound system. And he says, well, make sure you have a shower inside. I said, well, I would have a shower inside my car. He goes, well, if you're dumb enough to buy a car when we live in Manhattan, you're going to have to get out of my house. And he says, well, buy an apartment in the neighborhood. I said, Dad, this is not a good neighborhood. I grew up in the Lower East Side of New York City, pre-gentrification. And he yeah. says, look out the window. What do you see? I said, I see housing projects, Dad. And he says, no, pass the projects. I said, this is the World Trade Center. He goes, they'll never let this neighborhood stay the way that it is. Buy a piece of property as opposed to a depreciating asset. So that, that one piece of information led to rental property that paid for me to send my son to college. Now he doesn't have student loans. That's a great story. You know, the, the, you've, you've said this to me before, the first thing poor people want to do is prove they're not poor. And so they go out and buy an expensive watch or something like that, that doesn't necessarily add a lot of long-term value to their wealth situation. Right, and that's because money is so emotional. When you grew up without means, the first thing you want to do is prove to people that you made it. And you're not going to walk around with your 401k statement or show people rental property. You're going to show them a car, a watch, uh, things that don't improve in value. Um, but it makes you feel good, but it doesn't help you create generational wealth. Good point. So for underrepresented investors, a phrase, it's an awkward phrase I'm using it, though, uh, including, sort of, for example, black and Latino investors. Uh, is there a sort of different formula for making that decision on how to invest and when to invest uh, in terms of where you started and, and how far you have to go, how do you make that determination? Well, I, you know, what I, I try and tell my clients, the first thing we have to do is, is, is build a financial plan so we know exactly where they stand. Because one of the impediments to underrepresented investors is they don't necessarily have a plan B or they think the system doesn't work on their behalf. I mean, if you, the 1935 Social Security Act excluded farm workers and maids. Well, 75% of black workers in the South we're farm workers and maids. So we, we don't think that the system necessarily works on our behalf. So you have to overcome that obstacle. And then you have to show them that, you know, once you have an emergency fund, you, you can then take more risks. You can move past the, I have to make sure I have enough food in, in, the, in the pantry. 
to how do I create wealth for my children and my grandchildren. I want to just move on and ask you about the general market turmoil, what kind of advice you have for investors in general here. I mean, we've, we've seen this sort of, I don't know what you call it, a retail institutional frenzy, retail frenzy more accurately in, in the last few weeks. Um, people buying into beating up airline stocks or bankrupt stocks. It, do, what do you think is driving this? Does this say something about human nature? Is it zero dollar commissions? Are people just sitting at home with nothing to do? There's no sports, they don't, they're not working. What, what's driving this? And what do you tell investors about investing in these kinds of risky assets? Well, I, I certainly don't believe in, in buying companies that don't have, don't have a whole lot of cash flow, right? You know, we talk about the athletes not managing their money, but lo and behold, the Fortune 500 companies, they go a month without revenue and need, need, need a bailout. So, you know, I recommend companies with strong balance sheets in the right industry. I think some of it's the retail. You know, my own son was buying stocks on the, on, on the bottom, which means I didn't waste my money on, on his college education. What was he buying? Uh, what he did he bought, buy? He bought the, the Jets. He bought a Chinese stock that, that does like the Alibaba type of type investment. And he's done pretty well. And so when I you say Jets, you, when you say Jets, you mean the airlines. Jets. He bought the airlines. The air, I see he's buying airlines. Your son was doing everything, all these. Right, 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 right. I wish he had told me, you know, but, but <laughs> um, you know, shout out to Morehouse College. They've done a good job with him. But, you know, I think it's some of the retail investors. It's algorithms. Um, maybe it's a short squeeze, but I think also it's the Federal Reserve. I mean, if I saw a zebra limping and I said, I'm going to bet that the, the lions eat that zebra, and then the, the Federal Reserve puts a fence around the lions, I might look like I don't know very much about animal behavior. And so if you think about these companies that have cash flow shortfalls and the Fed creating a, a credit facilities that can give them a bridge loan of sorts, it might give the impression that everything is okay. But the problem is they still have a cash flow issue right, with, with, with a 13% unemployment rate. Um, and they also have to now pay back some of these loans. So I don't know that they solved the problem. They may have kicked the can down the road. It's a great analogy with the zebra. So you got an old zebra and the old zebra sees a lion. He'd be very worried about that lion. But if right. all of a sudden you put a fence around the lion, the zebra doesn't have anything to worry about and you can limp on for a lot longer. That, that's an analogy about old companies that would die a natural death. You, you let them live longer, right? If you're a zombie company that you can only survive um, by virtue of attracting more and more corporate debt, then it looks very much like you have a business model. And so yeah. that's why we've gone from a $4 trillion corporate bond market to $10 trillion. Half of the investment grade bonds are triple B. And if those bonds start to get downgraded into a, and, and sold off in a disorderly market because they're larger than the entire junk bond market, that creates more disruption. So I understand why the Fed is doing what they're doing. I just don't know if that's a long-term solution. Good analogy to use for the downside of the possible involvement of the Fed. Going to have to leave it there, Ivory. Thank you very much for joining us. Ivory Johnson, folks, is the founder of Delancey Wealth Management and a member of the CNBC Financial Advisors Council.